I'm John Lee, and this is Suketu, who, by the way, has just spent about 25 hours getting here, maybe more. 40, 40 hours. 40 hours. <laughs> I came from San Francisco, so. <laughs> so. It's, it's great to be in Georgia. If you, if you don't mind, Suketu, I'll take the liberty of, of opening it with a, by just reading out an extract of your book on Bombay to kick this off, because we're talking about writing about place and how you build stories out of a place. <clears throat> so this is uh, Suketu writing in his book about Bombay, now called Mumbai. I left Bombay in 1977 and came back 21 years later when it had grown up to be, become Mumbai. 21 years, enough time for a human being to <clears throat> be born, get an education, be eligible to drink, get married, drive, vote, go to war and kill a man. In all that time, I hadn't lost my accent. I speak like a Bombay boy. It is how I'm identified in Kampur and Kansas. Where are you from? Searching for an answer in Paris, in London, in Manhattan, I always fall back on Bombay. Somewhere buried beneath the wreck of its current condition, one of urban catastrophe, is the city that has a tight claim on my heart. A beautiful city by the sea, an island state of hope in a very old country. I went back to look for that city with a simple question. Can you go home again? In the looking, I found the cities within me. So that seems, uh, <clears throat> it's both a beautifully written passage and a very evocative uh, one that also spoke to me. Because unlike uh, Suketu, who grew up in India and, and whose family emigrated to America, and then he returned. I'm an American who grew up abroad. I lived in many countries and have always been a bit of a stranger in my own country. I grew up in nine countries by the time I was uh, 18, and I still live abroad. So uh, for me, uh, this, this spoke to me, the difference be perhaps between the perspective on the world of a, of a migrant or an immigrant, and in my case, of a, somehow a kind of an expatriate. Um, but both of us have in common that we're writers and have written about, we're journalists, we're writers, and we write about uh, the societies we live in, and place is a big part of that. Um, Tsuketu, what drew you back to, to write about Mumbai, this town you knew as Bombay, and again now, as a New Yorker, to write about this uh, emigrants, see people seeking home, seeking place, seeking purchase and identity in a world that's increasingly at, at flux. And how have you chosen to do that, I guess? That helps kick us off. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, John. It's a real honor to be on a panel with you. Um, uh, you know, I wrote this book about Bombay because I just, I wanted to go home. I was born in Calcutta and I grew up in Bombay and then uh, moved to New York with my family when I was 14. Um, and then 21 years later, I decided that I had to, you know, try to go home. I didn't know if there was going to be a book that would come out of it. Um, and I thought I would, you know, go for a year or two. I had a novel in the works, and I'd come back to New York, and I'd finish the novel. Well, seven years later, uh, this book on Bombay came out. And for me, it was an incredibly personal journey, but it couldn't just be about myself, because you know, the world is not interested in a biography of Suketu Mehta at this point. Um, what I wanted to do was write about this city through these different worlds of people that I met. So it was everyone from gangsters in the underworld to politicians to runaway poets to uh, the world of Bollywood. I, I wrote a very bad Bollywood movie while I was right, uh, living there, Mission Kashmir, a tense terrorist epic with song and dance. Um, um, and you know, I met all these different characters, the police, um, city planners, and I created this portrait of the city, but you can't just write 
these different sketches, otherwise it's just a bunch of magazine articles thrown together into a book. There had to be a thread, and the thread was my question, which was having gone back to the city, Mumbai, which I didn't recognize, um, would it accept me? Could I go home again? Uh, and in the end, I realized that I could go home again through the stories that the city yielded to me, through the incredible generosity of my characters, who told me all these stories, which in some cases you know, could have gotten them killed. Um, so, so that was my way of, of finding my place by going home. And a strange thing happened at the end of the book. I realized that once I could go home again, at the end of two and a half years, I could also leave again once more with confidence into the world. So I went back to New York, and now I've been writing a book on New York for the last 10 years. Also, um, New York is the last home of people who have no other home, right? Um, and so you've got this, you know, you, you grew up all around the world, and now you, you travel restlessly around the world, but you come back to Dorset. And we were speaking earlier about that, what it does to be able to come back to one place and to journey safely out of it, right? So maybe you could speak to that a bit. Not always to journey safely, but to come home safely. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Suketu's work speaks to me because all my life I've always, although I've written many things, um, I've never really written, I've never written a book about a place. I've always wanted to, and at several times in my life, I've thought, ah, this is the place I will write about. You know, and once it was a small English village in Oxfordshire where every day I would get up and I would run um, through the fields. And I got to know this, the outskirts of this village extremely well and some of the personalities within it very well. And it appealed to me as a writer to, to, to take on a challenge like that. How do you make something, if it's true that you can write about anything, which is one of the conceits, the great wisdoms and conceits of writers that... I should be able to write an interesting book about a village with 150 people. And I remember I, remember I knew the, the changing seasons so well I could describe how the stalks of cut corn looked in the autumn and there was a kind of prose poem appeal to this, to me. I remember at the time I'd read also Joseph Brodsky on Venice in fact, I reread a little bit of it before our talk, just thinking about it, and I wanted to remember how he opened this very short book. It's really a prose poem about Venice, which is maybe one of the most enduring little pieces of literature about a place. Um, and he describes his first impression is actually sensory. It's olfactory, it's smell. He says, I opened the door, I think of a train, and what I smelt was freezing seaweed, the smell of freezing seaweed. And it was at night, it was a windy night. And that's an interesting and a useful reminder, I think, to all of us who write, is to remember that we have six, in some cases seven senses, not just sight, but also sound. And often people forget that they have a sense of smell in writing, and it's a rich one. And Brodsky used that as his introduction to Venice. But I found myself, in trying to emulate this sort of style of approach to a place, I found myself bored with just writing about the way corn stubble looked in the winter. And at the time, I was beginning a project about to, that would take, a, take me to live in Cuba, a biography. And, and when I arrived in Havana, and I, Havana became a place that entranced me. Uh, it's a beautiful, ruined city, and it's got wonderful history. And at the time, it was not a tourist destination, and it felt unique. And I thought, one day I will write about Havana, but I haven't yet. What I have done, as opposed to you, Suketa, which is, because I have no real home city to return to, is um, I think in a lot of my New Yorker pieces where I, in some cases, I haven't been before. There's two types. There's the places I... It once in the many places I lived as a child or as a young man, I've returned to. Liberia is one of them, for instance. And so I have memories that I can draw upon that help anchor. In a way, it, I suppose it gives proprietorship to the, to the writer, a justification for my being there. 
and I'm able to call on a memory that somehow speaks to the present and which also allows me to leapfrog the history, which can be useful. It allows you to tell the story, the intervening years, what happened before and how the place has changed since you've been there. But in other places where I have not lived before or not been before, I find myself fixating usually for a long time. Very often it's the hardest thing I do in each piece on a physical description of the place. And uh, it's something my editors, it's, it, it, I think it drives them crazy, although they've never said that. Because usually I'll try to begin with my physical description. And I'm sure back in New York they go, there he goes again. Um, I did one on Zimbabwe once and I drove into the country. And for me, the, the description, I was going to set the reader in Zimbabwe through this drive I took. Because for me it was an incredibly evocative drive uh, in which all of the farms were destroyed the people were cutting down the citrus trees for firewood, can you imagine? There were fatal crashes along the way. There was an American hunter who'd come in to kill hippopotamuses for trophies in the middle of this charnel land, of, you know, this wasteland of corruption and, and, and uh, hunger. And in the end, all of that got cut. I think I managed to preserve a paragraph somewhere in the piece, but for me, it was an important positioning. It's as if I needed my own um, intellectual GPS, and it always has to do with the physical geography. So I'm not really answering your question. I've gone off on a tangent, but That's all right. That's I think why I'm a storyteller. I think this I, this this question of place identity, where where you come from, is is part of who we are. And as an expat, as opposed to an emigre like yourself, I. Um, I have similar feelings about New York, but I'm a, it's, the only part in, it's the only place in my country where I don't feel like a stranger, because everybody else is too. Um, and so I live, uh, I live as an adoptive foreigner, a Yank, in a small British town in, 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 in Dorset, in England. And anybody who knows England knows that unless you're born there or traveled there before you were 10, you're never really one of them. They have a unique resistance to uh, absorption of the other, even when you're, you know, look like them. So, so I, I, I have this tetchy or edgy otherness, even in the place I've chosen to live. And um, maybe I'll write about that one day. I don't know. Yeah. I, that's, I think that's essential, that sense of otherness, of not belonging of being vaguely uncomfortable in a place when you go. Um, you know, there's... I'm often asked, like, what am I looking for when I go to different places? So I don't just write about Bombay and New York. I've also written about Brazil, about Sri Lanka, um, about Europe. Um, uh, I've just come out with a book. Uh, about immigration, where I spent a lot of time in Tijuana, in Mexico, Tangier, in Morocco. So what am I looking for? And there's, there's a passage in the Italo Calvino book, Invisible Cities, which if you guys haven't read it, it's, it's an absolute masterpiece. Uh, so Invisible Cities is a short book. It's a series of conversations between and imagine conversations between Marco Polo and Kubla Khan. And Polo is telling Kubla Khan about all the cities that he has visited, and they're wonderful and fantastic cities. It's like those little prose poems. Um, and then in the end, uh, the Khan says to Marco Polo, he says, I notice there is one city of which you never speak. And Polo says, what is that city? And the Khan says, Venice. Venice, of course, is where Marco Polo is from. And then Marco Polo responds, what else do you think I have been speaking to you about all this time? So wherever Polo goes, he's looking for the universal Venice. And so where I go to Rio de Janeiro or New York or, or even Tbilisi, I'm looking for the parts of Bombay that are in these cities. And this morning, I remember, I was looking out over the street. Um, it's this narrow street that my hotel's on. And there was a grandmother pruning 
the bushes, uh, there was a police car downstairs with some guy with his hand out with a cigarette. There were school children running around and um, this kind of, this apartment block that I know well in, in Bombay, this drab gray apartment building with air conditioners uh, stuck on the outside like scabs on the building. And I thought, you know, this, is, this too is a part of Bombay. And if I went out and I spoke to these people, I would find my Bombay there. So, you know, I, I mostly write about cities. Um, and there's two groups of cities in the world. There's the big, successful, rich cities like New York and Paris and London. And then there's the vast, sprawling mega cities of the world, uh, of the developing world, like uh, Bombay and uh, Kinshasa, Lagos, uh, Sao Paulo to some extent, which just go on and on. But there's, there's, there are these invisible cities in um, all of these places which are accessible only if you step off the tourist trail and go with this kind of Inquiry, and that inquiry can't be an editor sending you somewhere. It, it has to be an internal question if you do it long enough, right? So for me, like Marco Polo's Venice in Invisible Cities, I want to go to each city and find the Bombay in it. Um, and I've certainly you know, found that in New York. Um, I found that in, in Rio with the, and we can both, we've both written about Rio. It's a, Part of it is very, very dangerous. There are these communities which are called favelas. The Brazilian word for them is comunidades, um, which are groups of, well, migrants who came in from the countryside. And now most of the economy there is a kind of drug economy. So when I went to Brazil uh, about 10 years ago, um, I got fascinated with these favelas. And I remember going to an all-night dance party. It was called a baile funk. And it was this surreal scene. You enter this uh, slum colony at midnight. It's on the hillsides. And there are teenagers with AK-47s guarding the entrance to this. And then you go in, uh, if you're allowed in, and then you dance all night to this incredibly compelling beat, this kind of Miami bass soundtrack. Uh, and there's Everyone on the street is stoned. And there's grandmothers dancing and children dancing. And the lyrics of the uh, songs, it's, it's a kind of a Brazilian hip hop called Baile Funk. Uh, it's all about cop killing and underage sex. And at any moment, a gunfight might break out because often at the Baile Funk, their um, rival gangs will uh, shoot someone who's informing on the police or has defected from one gang or the other. So at any moment, anything might happen. And everyone's stoned out of their minds. And I didn't know what I was doing there, but I just knew that it was somehow mysterious and alluring, but also reminded me of the street parties I'd been to in the Bombay underworld, right? So ostensibly, I was writing about Brazil, and you know, nothing happened to me at the Baile Funk. I did actually get held up at gunpoint, but that was in Sao Paulo on a the, the richest um, street in Sao Paulo, the Avenida Paulista. So, so when I'm digesting these experiences, when I'm writing about them, I'm looking inward. And I think, you know, you might experience the same thing. I'm, I'm looking to find my home in places which are very unlike my home all over the world. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, you touched on something just now. I hadn't thought it when we were chatting before, but I did now, which is that I think one of the things I look for, and which I, in my own exploration of Rio, I also went into a favela and got to know some of the gangsters that r rule that part of the society. And they live in permanent coexistence with the state. The gangster I got to know in the place I went called Moro de Dende in uh, uh, 2009 um, had a rap song uh, named after him and his exploits. And at the time he had been 10 years fugitive. They still haven't caught him. And he lives in plain sight. Why? Because uh, 
el asfalto, the asphalt, which they call the, the civilized, legally constituted part of the society, you know, where the buses run, sometimes right at the end of their hill, where the police are and there are judges and mayors and people going to work and so on, and their life is also run by a kind of mafia, particularly in Rio. The police have their own gangs, they can, and they compete for control of the city's uh, illegal economy. And also, uh, it's energy supplies, telecom supply, everything. This is the way it runs. And so, in discerning this, um, this duality that's so prevalent, so easy to see in a place like Rio, um, and, and it's also a place of surreal beauty with those mountains by the sea, um, and, the, and the vast, you know, extreme differences between the rich and the poor, and the, and the color composition usually of the rich and the poor as well. Um, it became a place that compelled me deeply. And I think I, what I was drawn to was in trying to examine this borderline that I think I'd seen throughout my life, as you had in, you were reminded of Mumbai or Bombay. And I was reminded of all of the other places I'd lived where uh, what is the legally constituted order of a place is in question and lives in uneasy and in some cases mm, unresolved coexistence with what is supposedly criminal or clandestine. I had seen it in New York back in the days of crack. I lived in Brooklyn, a Brooklyn that um, now is hipsterized and you know um, gentrified, but at the time I could never get a cab into New York City, into Manhattan, which was New York City at the time. And nobody I knew in Manhattan ever came to see me in Brooklyn. And sometimes uh, there would be gunfights. The only restaurant nearby was a bulletproof Chinese takeaway. And literally it was bulletproof. Um, and um, the house, or the rather apartment building immediately behind this one, which stands on a major avenue, was a crack den and the police never came there. And I remember this feeling of living in you know, this vast city in the United States at a time when there was this unspoken duality, very obvious, that was obviously there. And again, but seeing it eternalized in a place like Rio is, is fascinating. And um, I suppose, maybe, maybe in, in thinking, I'm thinking aloud here, maybe for me, that is a kind of search for a place because I spent a lot of years going and visiting and, and living with guerrilla groups and becoming fascinated because although they, they were sometimes in control of a certain territory, they, they had to move around. And they carried their societal lore, they carried their folklore in their heads. They had an oral history. In some cases it was attached to, this is where comrades such and such died. This is where we had that battle. But it wasn't part of the legally constituted press or history books at all. You had to go into the clandestine life of the guerrillas and live with them for a while to see it and to know it. And it only existed orally. They were like an uncontacted tribe, in a sense. And this fascinated me. So in a sense, I guess I have always been attracted to this idea of the imaginary homeland or the place that exists because it is told as a story, because of storytelling, which is somehow as real as the other story told, which is basically told by the markets and real estate developers, isn't it? Hmm. Um, I actually set out to do a story about real estate development in Coney Island in New York. And I found a guerrilla movement in Coney Island. Um, so Coney Island is the amusement district of New York. It's you know roller coasters and uh, the cyclone um, and um, the parachute jump. It's really it's the people's playground, uh, the the capital of fun. And the city has this plan, this five billion dollar plan to develop it, put up condominiums, hotels. Uh, so I went there to speak to people, not just in the amusement district, but then there's a, 
there's a big housing development where there's an African American and Latino drug gang. And I remember going into the, the stairwell of this housing project and these young black and Latino men, they were all armed and um, they were telling me that they had a stake in this urban plan for Coney Island, that they felt that they should be consulted. And I asked why, they said, because my motherfucking blood is on these streets. And it was literally true for them. Their blood was on the streets. You know, they'd been living there, they'd, they'd grown up there, but very few people had bothered to ask them um, their idea of place, of what Coney Island should be. And uh, around the same time, I was also hanging out with another drug gang in New York, um, a very different kind of drug gang. And it was a group of some 30 young women, mostly models and actresses, who had New York's most boutique weed delivery ring. It was called the Green Angels. And there were 30 young women, uh, well-educated, beautiful, who sold marijuana to the good and the great of New York City, uh, including people like Rihanna and Jimmy Fallon. And, and it was led by a 27-year-old former Mormon supermodel. Jesus <clears throat> And this woman was one of the finest natural entrepreneurs I've ever met. So for two years, I hung out with them, delivered weed with them. Um, and I saw the two very different systems of justice in New York. These women, because they were attractive and poised, could get into any building in New York. No doorman would ever stop them. In six years of operation, they had never once been stopped by the cops. And they made much more money than the African-American drug gang but the African Americans were in and out of jail all the time. They were, you know, they were selling, they were also selling weed, they were also selling, you know, uh, heroin and, and other drugs. But um, it was really interesting to see the two different systems of justice and also the different economies of these drug gangs. Um, and so I live in New York, I, I live in Greenwich Village, but in New York there are all these worlds that are inaccessible, um, and, and these are you know, the worlds which I'm most fascinated by, like the ones which take some time to get into. Um, it, it's, it's not just a professional challenge. These are the stories which you were talking about, unwritten stories or untold stories. And I feel that these are the stories that both of us tell, the ones that aren't recorded in historians' archives. We can't go into a library and read about them, right? This is, this is where journalism really is the first draft of history. No, absolutely. absolutely. Um, I was thinking, gosh, you know, it, we're going to run short, especially if we want uh, to allow uh, questions. And you and I had talked, actually, it was your suggestion to, that we should maybe talk about some nuts and bolts. Yes. And wh where do you think we should start yeah, with Yeah, basically, that? like, you know, how do you write these things? How do you write yeah, magazine yeah. articles? How do you write books? Um, in my case, so I wrote my Bombay book, Maximum City, took seven years. I've been working for 10 goddamn years on a book about New York. Um, and at this point, I feel like I've spoken to every New Yorker. Um, but it's something that, again, is, is just it feels essential for me to write. It's the only other book about a city that I'm going to write. Um, but in the meantime, I um, interrupted or paused the New York book to write a book about global migration, which has just come out in the US. It's called This Land is Our Land, because I felt compelled out of rage, out of outrage about the way uh, immigrants are depicted around the world. Um, so, you know, I guess we should talk about like how we actually, I, I'll talk about how the books are done since, since this is most of what I do. Um, the, I think the most important thing when it comes to writing a book is that you, know, you can write a, a shorter piece because an editor assigns you to do something. But a book really has to be written out of necessity. It has to be something that drives you internally because it's too long a process to um, continue with if you don't have an inner burning need to 
get to the end of. And you know, you, you'll never know what the end of the book is when you start it. Um, you, you might begin with a character or an idea or, or a story, or, and then it, it goes all over the place and you have no idea where you'll end up. It also helps to have a really good editor. Um, and an editor who, you know, I'm asked like, when do you know, when you stop researching and start writing, right? Because you first you're just out gathering the stories. It's a strange process. You're out every day and speaking to these characters, and then you kind of bury yourself in a room for a year or two years or three years, and then you write. So this is incredible going out of yourself and then coming back into yourself. And you, with the book, the compulsion also is that you can just get carried away with the research because you get involved with the lives of your characters. So when do you stop? When your editor starts using profanity, right? You know, get the damn thing done. Yeah, get it. Yeah. <laughs> Which happens to me with great frequency. But um, the, um, again, I think most of my stories, uh, I think like yours, are ones that uh, I want to do anyway. Occasionally, and I've only, I, haven't, I think you've written more travel stories than I have for magazines. I've done only two or three. Funnily enough, although I spend my life traveling, I, and I've re we've read a lot of the similar authors, you know, V.S. Naipaul, Conrad, Graham Greene, Paul Theroux, these sorts of people who have made their, who are known for their writing about other places or places they go to. And so somehow their references, even Kapuscinski in a way for me, although we didn't discuss him, um, they're, they're an analogous figures, maybe of a different era, different generation, different perspective. Um, but they, that what they have in common is this kind of restless need to explore um, aspects of the world we live in. And in, in, with each of them, I've found something in common. And so they, they've served me as inspirational or figures of, uh, uh, yeah, inspirational figures at times, although I've always needed and known that I've needed to find my own voice, my own style. They're analogous, but they're not exactly right. And so that process of finding your voice, finding your eye, finding your particular story is, I think, the key thing. And so, again, I would go back to this issue that, at least for me, and I think generally, if, especially since we're talking in a, within the context of a storytelling festival, for me, place is all about the stories that are there. It's not only about the physical description, talking about my boring drive from the South African border to Harare and Zimbabwe. I mentioned a few things that happened along the way. These to me were, this gave content, this gave, this peopled and gave drama to an otherwise inert landscape. It wasn't about the place so much as it was about the, the drive or what I saw on the road, but it was about what happened along the way, which is the essence of most good travel writing when it works well. But I've never felt comfortable with the form. And I've done a few assignments where people have said, oh, John Lee, you know Columbia so well, for instance. Will you write about Columbia for us? And then we, we decide which part of Columbia. I did, I'm thinking about a piece I did maybe two years ago. Uh, not for the New Yorker, it was for a travel magazine. And again, like I say, this is maybe the third or fourth one I've ever done. And I went to this landscape in the north where, you know, it's now safe to travel inland from the Caribbean coast. And I went to a, a beautiful old town on the Magdalena River, Mompox, that I'd never been to before. And on the way, I hadn't really thought about it until the drive. I realized we were going through a, a landscape where most of the worst massacres in the recent war, especially from the paramilitary side, took place. And we went past within a stone's throw of a town, village called El Salado, where in, I think it was 2002, a three-day massacre took place where these guys came in and literally murdered, raped, took apart people in the soccer pitch um, at will. Um, to, and they had a band playing. They all did it in a company to, to music. It was the most horrific thing ever. You know, you couldn't, it's worse than Saw 3, you know. Um, so I f when I finally sat down to write the article, I, I was aware that, okay, it's a travel magazine. They want to know about the new Columbia. 
But I thought, well, I have to include this business about, you know, by the way, on the way there, you have to know what the backdrop is, what the recent history is. And I felt that it would be immoral for me to write about this place without including that history. And it became a bit of a tug of war with the editor, gentle tug of war, but nonetheless, it was a tug of war. I remember in describing, and I'll end this, the vignette there, the, um, the massacre, and, I, and she, she came back in the editing press and says, you know, the, the massacre bit, uh, the orgy of death kind of thing, she says, you know, you describe them cutting people alive with chainsaws, killing them with hammers, and also with drills and screwdrivers. Can we maybe get rid of one of them? Just, you know, for simplicity's sake, one or two of them? And, I, and, we, and there, there was the tug of war over the paragraph in which I described with gruesome and chilling and, you know, memorable detail, unforgettable detail, the ways in which people were murdered there. And I think I gave her maybe screwdrivers and kept chainsaws or something. But it was, it was like that. And for me, this was... This was um, in the end, I lived with the published article, but I feel, and I felt then, and I feel now still unsettled by the fact that I had to edit it because after all, it was for a publication, the ultimate purpose of which was to get people to travel to that area. So it feels like I've made a compromise of sorts and in this evocation of place. It's there, but it's not as bloody as I would have told the story. Anyway. I had a similar experience with uh, writing for a travel publication, Condé Nast Traveler. They sent me on a dream assignment to go to the Caribbean, the green islands of the Caribbean, St. Lucia, Dominica, St. Vincent. Unfortunately, I went to this dream assignment with a woman I was seeing at the time, and our relationship was ending, and it ended midway through the trip. <laughs> she got on a plane and went back to New York, and then I sent in this article to my editor, which was, you know, it began with waterfalls and swimming, and then it ended with problems with development in the countries and incest among the Carib, Carib Islanders and, you know, pollution and uh, overfishing. And my editor reads this and she said, Sukedu, we're a travel magazine. Our readers want to know you have a good time. They want to experience the green Caribbean with you, splash in waterfalls and eat grilled fish and they don't want to know about the damn Carib Islanders and their incest. That's for another magazine. So <laughs> rewrite it. And I realized that, you know, for this, this kind of writing about place is really, you're waiting to get your teeth drilled in a dentist's waiting room and you pick up a magazine and there's all these photos of this travel porn and then you, it's kind of an es escapism. Yeah. Right, so, so that's not generally the kind of articles that I write. My Bombay book, for example, which is, it, it's mis sometimes mistakenly classified as travel literature, but I sometimes get letters from people who read the book and say, dear Mr. Mehta, I have always wanted to go to Bombay, but then I read your book. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a kind of armchair literature that makes you stay in your armchair. Um, you know, something else you were talking about, these, um, how stories make up a place, you know, and so there's, each city has an official story and an unofficial story. So the official story is real estate brochures and the, um, how the governments brand the city. There's all these branding consultants that work with these cities to, to brand them as this or that. But then, you know, what we do is we get the unofficial stories. And one group of people that I look for often in these cities is uh, uh, letter writers. So in Bombay, there's a group of men sitting with typewriters, manual typewriters, opposite the post office. And illiterate villagers come there and you know, uh, get these letter writers to type out letters to their families back in the village. And so if you read these letters, there's this fascinating archive of villagers who move to the city, um, or often prostitutes will ask these letter writers to uh, write letters to their clients who might be abroad, you know, to ask for money. 
And there was this one guy in Bombay who was a love letter expert. So he would write letters to uh, uh, you know, men or women who the, the actual lover didn't feel that he uh, had the right phrases. So he would turn to the love letter expert who was almost always drunk. And then he would bring in lyrics from ABBA and Bollywood lyrics and you know, really romantic Victorian phrases. So I just hung out with this love letter expert and watched the, uh, what love was in the great metropolis. And I saw the same thing in Mexico City, in the arcades of downtown Mexico City. A group of people with typewriters, um, you know, these letter writers and these scribes. Uh, and then I asked if they too had a love letter writer. And they said, oh yeah, there used to be one here, but you know, he's no longer working. And I said, why? I mean, is it like uh, people using the internet? They said, no, sadly, nobody is falling in love anymore. Maybe we should, um, maybe, yeah, maybe we should uh, open it up. That's a really nice note to end on. Do you suppose that's true? Has, has porn killed romanticism? I suppose it has. Or maybe it's Tinder that has, right? What is that thing people go on? Yeah, nobody, nobody flirts anymore. They just flip and then meet, right? Hi there. I wanted to ask about legitimacy in terms of writing about a place. So if you're from a place, presumably you're qualified to write about it. People don't have issues with it. It probably adds an extra cachet. He or she is from there. Obviously, they'll write about it. I wanted to ask about a play, situations where, A, you're not from there. Obviously, you've both traveled and written about places you're not from, whatever it means to be from somewhere. But it becomes even more complicated when you're white and writing about South Africa, or you're from another colonial, sort of former colonizer writing about a colonial place and so on. How do you deal with the challenges involved in that? Like basically, who are you to write about this? How dare you write about this? Yes, you've come here. Yes, you've seen it. But why are you the one to write about this? That's an excellent question, and one we were just discussing before we came here. Who has the right to write about a place, right? There's all these questions of cultural appropriation. Um, and it used to be with travel writing, generally it was white men going out um, and exploring, you know, the empire, uh, with, with some exceptions, there are also white women who are allowed to go and write about the other. And I was telling John Lee once, at the magazine National Geographic, um, was, you know, they wanted me to write for them and we were batting around ideas. And I said to them, so National Geographic particularly was known as this magazine where um, people would go out, Americans or uh, British people, and they would go to places like Africa and then bring back stories of tribal Africa and have lots of pictures of topless African women. Uh, and I said, what if you got you had a special issue of the magazine with Africans or Latin Americans or Asians and got them to come to America and write about, you had Congolese writers writing about Iowa, you had Paraguayan writers writing about New York. You know, how, how about if you have the, the other examining the self? They said, great idea, and of course never did it. Um, but so, so there's now a wave of non-white writers going out from outside the Imperium and, and coming into, you know, that's why I can, I have a publishing contract to write a book about New York. Um, I would, sometimes it's a challenge to write about a place that one has no idea about, like Brazil. Um, I, I went there for two and a half years and I was writing about it, but I, I didn't really speak the language. Um, uh, and it was, it was more of a challenge and, I asked myself this as um, my our common friend William Dalrymple. He is an Englishman who would write a lot about India, and he had these same questions. Like he writes about you know the Mughals. Like could he, as a white Englishman, write about the Mughals? Well, it turned out that he comes from a family of colonial administrators, and now he actually lives in Delhi. Um, so I think you know 
it's legitimate to have these questions of who has the right to write about what, but ultimately, as writers, we give ourselves the license to write about any damn thing we please. I would like to write about Ingemar Bergman or the history of ice cream. Um, I don't just want to stick to topics about India. I mean, you know, this, this question sometimes can be just, Tolkien wasn't a hobbit, so could he have written Lord of the Rings? Uh, Tolstoy's not a woman, could he write Anna Karenina? Yeah. Well, now there's this debate, in, isn't it, in Hollywood that's begun that s certain uh, LG in the LGBT community are, have started saying that unless you're, you're gay yourself, you shouldn't play, a, you know, perform as a gay actor. In other words, play a gay role. I think, you know, you get into really trouble, troubled waters when you start having these kind of, this, this zealous, sensor, censorious approach to how we tell stories and how we perform. It, it really limits the, the atmosphere, the necessary atmosphere of freedom, I think, that creative people need, need in order to operate. Repression also works, but um, it's not very happy. As a white guy who writes about all other parts of the world, I fall back on your last statement. We write about what we damn well please. It never occurred to me that there could be a, an issue, maybe because of my upbringing. You know, I grew up in all of these different countries. I feel very conversant, especially in Latin America, but also Africa, although I'm white, uh, because I lived there and I had very formative experiences there amongst Africans. Uh, in West Africa, particularly, but also East. And then, you know, I have a polyglot approach to life. We had a multicultural family. My parents had children and also adopted children. So I have a multi-hued family. Um, and that may be an unusual experience, but it, it made me just plow on through life. And it wasn't until about four years ago, maybe, no, a bit more, six years ago, I did a story on, I went to the, South Sudan for its birth in 2011. It's now, of course, a miasma of gore, right? Um, it's fallen apart into a civil war. And I found, I always try to read about the place I'm going, especially if I've never been there before, and I had not been to South Sudan. Um, and I, um, you know, read articles, but I also look for books. And I look for fiction and I look for history. And interestingly, South, uh, Sudan was the first of the British colonies to become. It, it initiated the great decolonization process. I think it was 56, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it was the first to go, and it was, it was never a well-defined country. It had kept changing its name. It was the Anglo-Egyptian you know, condominium at one point. It kept changing its name. It finally ended up as Sudan. British colony and then disappeared. The only books I could find of history were of were British colonials. And the closest things I could find uh, to Sudan that somehow spoke to me of that earlier experience in which the ill-defined borders of that region were books by authors who'd written about Somalia and uh, Ethiopia. It was curious. There was almost nothing there. So I felt there was a kind of clean slate, but for the first time I realized what a lot of people have for some time, which is that there are entire countries and societies who have not been able to tell their own story. Someone was saying this last night in the opening session about Georgia, the inability that it was Natalia, uh, the inability of Georgians to tell, or the, the struggle to tell their own story over centuries. And uh, something that I think is a really valid and important um, observation to make and, and something to know. And I very much felt it when I went to Sudan. But I also felt that I had as much a right to write about this weird concoction of a new country as anyone else. Um, I found myself rubbing shoulders with missionaries, mercenaries, warlords, tribesmen, UN people and NGOs who felt they had the ultimate right to define what was happening there. They had banned the word tribalism almost from discussion as a kind of cultural no-no, something that you don't say anymore. Of course, it turned out to be tribalism, which is precisely what doomed the, the newborn country. Um, and so again, I would, I would argue against this kind of, 
trend we have in sometimes really well-intended amongst well-intended liberal, uh, liberal society within well-intended liberal society to correct the past by altering or enforcing some kind of code to the way we speak about the present because it obviates and silences people who could otherwise participate in the conversation. And ultimately, it stultifies the really necessary, sometimes painful debate that has to take place in public in a sensitive way. Otherwise, you end up with the goons in control. Um, you know, and I'm speaking, of course, of Donald Trump and others like him um, who say whatever they want and, um, and don't worry about these niceties. But this issue of cultural appropriation, I, again, I became aware of as a result of that story. I've been aware of it ever since. I'm, as a writer, I'm thrilled to see um, people from the countries now emerging, not just now, but have been for years. Some countries more, more prolific than others. And, and they have become the narrators of their societies. But for a long time, in some cases, they're, they're, they didn't have that ability, they didn't have that capacity, and there's an overlap. But I don't think that, you know, just as, I don't know, Zadie Smith lives in London, and, you know, she comes from a different background. There's, there's, we have a new kind of cosmopolitanism that's taken place in the world. You have an amazing night, a publishing industry in Nigeria, which has given voice and world and a world stage to Nigerian authors that simply didn't have it 20 years ago. And that's a good thing. But I don't think that that means that I can't, if I want, go to Nigeria and try to write about something there. The reader, the public, will ultimately decide whether I've crossed the line or not. You either have an audience or readership or you don't. And it's based upon, I think, I think you know, people have a bullshit detector or maybe an ethical or morality detector, don't you think? It's also a question of who the gatekeepers are, yeah. who the publishers are, who decide whose stories get told, who, who's on the prize committee that decides what books get awarded. You know, a, and so I think I understand um, when people say we should be allowed to tell our stories and there's too many other people from outside who are telling our stories. I think there should be a level playing field and that's where it gets more complicated. The question of who chooses what stories get told. Someone else, a uh, young lady here, maybe. Hi. Um, oh. I'm lucky enough to have lived in a couple of places that you mentioned in this talk, Venice and New York. And one of the things that's really fascinated me about living in those places is how the people kind of move through the city and as you become a New Yorker or as you become a Venetian or if you are a Venetian, you move through the city in a different way to the tourists. And in Venice, it's particularly interesting because there are only 50,000 Venetians and there are 20 million tourists every year. And I started to notice the Venetians would dart off in different directions off the tourist route and kind of take these little back alleys. And it wasn't necessarily a shortcut, it was more of a question of ownership of the city, I think. Um, and in Tbilisi, I live in Tbilisi now, and like my friend here told me about how to move through Tbilisi. He said, like, just focus on where you want to go and move in that direction. Don't look at the map because the map's going to send you on some kind of meandering hairpin bend. Just go and there'll be a way. And that kind of, I think, speaks a little bit to maybe to Georgian mentality. I don't know. But I just wondered if you made these kind of observations about in the places that you visited, because I think it speaks a lot to how the people of those cities are as well. I think everyone should live as a tourist in their own city. I think, you know, sometimes I just get on a sightseeing bus and go around New York. I mean, one out of five people on the island of Manhattan is a tourist. So just like when if, it's like Paris, the city is getting overrun by tourists and where I live in Greenwich Village, you're more likely to hear Portuguese and French and Italian than you are, you know, that New York accent. Um, I, I like getting lost in cities, I think. So, one of the problems with having GPS at our fingertips is that we don't get lost enough in cities. And that's my favorite way of exploring a new city or even the city that I live in. I've been living in New York for 40 years now, on and off. And there's still art streets that I've never been on. Um, and, and part of it is, 
you know, not seeing the city um, by car, but by actually walking. And so the, the, the older cities, the cities that I like most, the way is that I like to move through cities is actually just following a lane and, uh, and getting lost in the, in the maze of the cities. This is very hard if there's a big expressway across your uh, path and, and, you, and you can't cross it. And many of the newer cities now in the world, unfortunately, um, have, um, have, you know, the, the, what's prized is the automobile. So Bombay, for example. Bombay used to be a great walking city. No more. It's just overrun with cars. And the more cars there are, the more the, um, the municipal government seems to think that if they only built more roads, then they'd have less traffic. No. The, the biggest new development in Bombay these days is a giant new bridge that serves one function. It gets you to your traffic jam faster. Um, so, um, yeah, walking, I think, is essential in, uh, to, uh, and walking without a map or without a, a phone. I would just add one thing very quickly to that, and, and it's something I tell young uh, journalism students in workshops, and, and about myself, it's something I've learned about my, myself. My, my first impressions in a new place are always the first few days. I, especially if I'm on my own and not sharing it with someone else, I pour everything into my notebook. And I used to, as off and on, I've kept diaries, which I also encourage everyone to do because you, you're, you're on your own with your own thoughts and impressions and you can observe things around you, just observe. And one thing I noticed is that after a certain number of days in a place, you begin to block off your senses. Your senses become dull and inured to the new place, you no longer notice what you noticed in the first few days, the smell of, of uh, what was it, winter seaweed, I think uh, Brodsky's blast of winter seaweed on a windy night in Venice, um, uh, the color of the river that runs through the town, the, uh, the way people move, their body language, the way women and men are together or not. Uh, the way they look at each other, the way they gesticulate. What, and, uh, and this is the, the real key, what's above the first floor? What's above the shop fronts? Once you live in a city and you know where the grocers is and how to get from here to there, you stop looking up at the second and third and fourth stories. You don't do it anymore. You never s look above the commercial hoardings, much less look at the night sky. Very few people in cities look at the sky anymore. And so these are all like things to know, I think about, um, and, and that what we're talking about, this idea of understanding a place. When you don't know anything, all of your senses kick in. And if you're recording them on your thoughts on paper, it's a, it's a great way to, I think, have heightened, a heightened sense of awareness about a place. It's amazing when you do go back through old diaries or old notes and you've done that, what you've, what you've recorded, what you've registered and what you've forgotten about. So th that's what I would say. It's, yeah. Uh, and on that note, I think, I don't know, some last thoughts to get to? Well, since we're talking about place, um, if you permit me, I'll read out a paragraph from my Bombay book. This is, um, So this is a paragraph which I think it summarizes my Bombay. Um, so when I went back to Bombay, um, it was a, a riven city. There were these incredibly bloody Hindu Muslim riots. Um, people had been burned alive for belonging to the wrong religion. I sat in police stations and watched them torture uh, people and then shoot people in these extrajudicial killings. And I kept looking for hope in this massive city. And I found it in the strangest place, in the incredibly crowded commuter trains of Bombay. The manager of Bombay's suburban railway system was once asked when the system would improve to a point where it could carry its eight million daily passengers in comfort. Not in my lifetime, he answered. <laughs> 
Certainly, if you commute into Bombay, you are made aware of the precise temperature of the human body as it curls around you on all sides, adjusting itself to every curve of your own. A lover's embrace was never so close. My friend Asad bin Saif works in an institute for secularism, moving tirelessly among the slums, cataloging numberless communal flare-ups and riots, seeing firsthand the slow destruction of the social fabric of the city. Asad is from Bhagalpur, in the state of Bihar in the north, site not only of some of the worst communal rioting in the nation, but also of a gory incident where the police blinded a group of petty criminals with knitting needles and acid. Asad, of all people, has seen humanity at its worst. I asked him if he feels pessimistic about the human race. Not at all, he responded. Look at the hands from the trains. If you are late for work in the morning in Bombay, and you reach the station just as the train is leaving the platform, you can run up to the packed compartments and you will find many hands stretching out to grab you on board, unfolding outward from the train like petals. As you run alongside the train, you will be picked up and some tiny space will be made for your feet on the edge of the open doorway. The rest is up to you. You will probably have to hang on to the door frame with your fingertips, being careful not to lean out too far, lest you get decapitated by a pole placed too close to the tracks. But consider what has happened. Your fellow passengers already packed tighter than cattle are legally allowed to be. Their shirts already drenched in sweat in the badly ventilated compartment. Having stood like this for hours, retain an empathy for you, Know that your boss might yell at you or cut your pay if you miss this train and will sp make space where none exists to take one more person with them. And at the moment of contact, they do not know if the hand that is reaching for theirs belongs to a Hindu or Muslim or Christian or Brahmin or untouchable or whether you were born in this city or arrived only this morning or whether you live in Malabar or Jogeshwari, whether you're from Bombay or Mumbai or New York. All they know is that you're trying to get to the city of gold, and that's enough. Come on board, they say. We'll adjust. This is from East Bombay.